Welcome to the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art. My name is Max Delaney, Artistic Director and CEO, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our lecture series, Defining Moments, Australian Exhibition Histories, 1968-1999. Now in its second year, the series explores critical exhibitions and projects that have shaped Australian art since 1968. Ambitious, contested, polemical, genre-defining and genre-defying exhibitions that have informed and transformed the cultural landscape along with our understanding of what constitutes art itself. To begin, I would like to sincerely acknowledge the Kulin Nations as sovereign custodians of the land upon which we work and welcome visitors here at ACCA. And we extend our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to all First Nations people. Defining Moments, Australian Exhibition Histories, traces the legacies of artists and curators, addresses the critical reception of significant selected projects, and reflects on a wide range of exhibitions and formats, from artist-run initiatives to new institutional models, as well as interventions in public space and remote communities. The first year of lectures are available as podcasts on ACCA's website. This year, in response to COVID-19, we are pleased to present the series as filmed illustrated lectures online, with the second season continuing to explore new models and modes of exhibition making that emerged in the 1980s and 90s, including the Asia Pacific Triennial and 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art, as well as exhibitions and projects led by First Nations artists and curators in Australia and internationally, among others. Defining Moments is presented in association with our long-standing partner Abercrombie and Kent and research partner, the Centre of Visual Art, COVA, at the University of Melbourne. It is supported by our media partners, Art Guide Australia, The Saturday Paper and Triple R, and our event partners, The Melbourne Gin Company, CAPI and the City of Melbourne, all of whom we sincerely thank and acknowledge. For our third lecture in this series, we're delighted to welcome John Mundine OAM to reflect on the Aboriginal Memorial, first presented at the Biennale of Sydney in 1988 and now regarded as one of the most significant works in Australian art history. The Aboriginal Memorial was conceived in the 1980s in the lead up to the so-called Australian Bicentenary in 1988, which marked 200 years since the arrival of the first fleet of British convict ships at Sydney in 1788. A time of tension and conflict, the official Bicentenary celebrations triggered considerable debate and demonstration in Australia, particularly related to Aboriginal rights, national identity, and the interpretation and memorialisation of Australian history colonial invasion and Aboriginal resistance in the frontier wars. We are honoured to welcome independent curator, writer and activist John Mundine, a member of the Budjalung people of North New South Wales, who is centrally involved in the conception of the memorial to reflect on its development, the cultural and political context of its realisation and its subsequent permanent installation in the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Please join me in welcoming John Mundine. My name is uh, John Mundine, and I'm a curator, writer, activist, and sometime artist. I'm here today, though, to speak to you about the late 1980s and early 90s, uh, and about a specific work within that called The Aboriginal Memorial, a piece that I conceived of and worked with a community of artists uh, at a place called Remanginning in central Arnhem Land. Uh, Remanginning is a small uh, town, most famous because it is the home of the actor David Goupilil. And it's the place where the film, The Ten Canoes, was shot. In the late 1980s, a number of things very specific to non-Western European people's art uh, was uh, a, a topic of discussion, not only in Australia, but partly because of uh, what happened overseas that influenced uh, Australians to think differently. In America, there's a number of exhibitions, the primitivism in Western 20th century art at the Museum of Modern Art. There was to Maori at the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. And in Australia, 
we were supposed to celebrate the coming of uh, the British to Australia and eventually how they colonised Australia. So by the uh, late 1980s, uh, many things had happened uh, positively in uh, the field of Aboriginal cultural practice. For the first time, you had an Aboriginal person being the chair of the Aboriginal Arts Board, uh, Chica Dixon from uh, La Perouse in uh, Sydney, and uh, the director is uh, the activist Gary Foley, was made the director of the Aboriginal Arts Board. Uh, he also comes from New South Wales, uh, really from Nambucca Heads. So you had these two people in charge of very prominent positions. Now, at that time, uh, Bangara, the dance company, had come into uh, full swing as a creative company and was being recognised as such. Uh, you had uh, a group of Western art school trained Aboriginal artists from the southeast of the country, and they came together to form Bumali. Uh, Aboriginal Artist Cooperative. Rather than be denied access uh, in other places, in biennales, in, in commercial galleries, they decided that they would lease their own space and start to curate their own shows in inner city Sydney, in Chippendale, in the late 1980s. In the north, the Aboriginal art centres in regional Aboriginal communities had fought off a, a uh, reduction in their funding uh, from the Commonwealth Government. And they were successful in that they employed a uh, doctor of economic, Aboriginal economics called Dr John Altman, who concluded the Altman Report that convinced the government not to cancel that money. And so they'd fought that off as well. So there's lots of activity, lots of discussion amongst Aboriginal artists and, uh, and lots of uh, promotion and acceptance of Aboriginal art. For instance, the Perspective Exhibition now included Aboriginal art just as a matter of course, as part of the contemporary art movement within Australia. As 1988 approached uh, and this uh, celebration called the Bicentenary, the 200 years since this fleet of convicts and, and their guards has arrived in uh, what is now called Sydney Harbour to set up a colony, uh, there was a political movement against that. Lots of Aboriginal artists and Aboriginal people uh, in the cultural field and lots of non-Aboriginal people were boycotting the bicentenary celebrations. Many white Australian artists, in fact, had uh, withdrawn their works from bicentennial shows, uh, as well as Aboriginal artists. As a commercial enterprise uh, in Ramanginning, which was set up to ensure uh, returns to artists, some of the most uh, economically deprived people in Australia, any boycott decisions uh, would have strong economic consequences. The problem was for me was to present Aboriginal culture without celebrating the bicentennial event. Historically, all Aboriginal art expression is personal and political in nature, as well as event orientated. So the white Australian 1988 bicentenary celebrations presented just such an important ideal opportunity. I was approached by the director of the Sydney Biennale for that year, Nicholas Waterlow, to do something about truth and justice in regard to Aboriginal people. So I had an idea in the back of my head, uh, this is two years out from the Biennale, to make a forest of burial poles, an artistic forest, a metaphorical forest. But because these uh, burial poles uh, in ceremony contain the bones of deceased people, 
uh, in ceremony and ritual, uh, this would also be like a forest of coffins. And a forest of coffins is like an Aboriginal memorial to all the Aboriginal people who died defending their country since 1788. In northeastern Arnhem Land, present day Aboriginal people carry on many age old ceremonies and rituals even today. One of these is the hollow log or bone coffin ceremony. When a person dies, the body is washed, uh, painted with relevant totemic designs of their soul, sung over and mourned. Uh, Some time later, the bones of the deceased are recovered. They're normally uh, placed, uh, wrapped up and placed in a tree, on a p tree platform, or they may be buried. So many years uh, later, they, the bones of the deceased are, are recovered and distributed to relatives in a special ceremony. Following a period, which may be years, the relatives hand over the bones to ceremonial leaders for them to hold what's called a bone coffin ceremony. A log that's been hollowed out naturally by termites is found. It's cleaned and painted with uh, the same body relevant clan designs like the body amidst uh, singing and dancing in a special camp uh, for those uh, completing the ritual away from the public domain. The bones are cleaned, painted with red ochre and placed in the hollow log in a, in a group of special dances. When a set series of songs and dances have been uh, completed, the log is carried and danced into the main public camp. The last song of that cycle is Running Water, where the body, the pole with the bones, is carried along through running water. It's then uh, carried into the main camp, into the public space and stood upright. It's then left to decompose and return to the environment. Now in the Aboriginal cultural life historically or traditionally, all Aboriginal art is made really in a ritual or a performance process. It was about the coming together of uh, groups of uh, people, related people, across ages and genders who were related in a structural way to each other to come together to sing and dance and create visual art pieces and performance spaces uh, over a period of days and nights. And uh, the planning of those performances and the collecting of people to play the parts in those performances may actually take years to bring to fruition. Now, certain people would dance for uh, would dance for other people's songs. Certain people would uh, paint uh, other people's bodies. You're in a very specific connection to the per people you paint. Uh, it's not everyone, no matter what the culture is, the, that you allow someone else to have that intimate relationship of touching your body, to paint your body. So what happens is these people come together to paint, sing, dance, and venerate or sing to God, really, over days and nights, but the idea of it, uh, of this, the concept around it was to reinforce their relationships to each other. As I said, certain people dance for other people's songs, very specific songs and specific related dances or imagery that was painted on their bodies for that time. 
It was to reaffirm their relationship to each other. It was to re reaffirm their relationship to the society that they belonged to. It was to bond and reinforce the generational bond they would bring younger people into that practice, into that event, to take part and learn, be educated into the meaning of that, uh, uh, those art practices and to the reasons why they were doing this. It was to reinforce their relationships to the environment because all these songs, dances and other things related to a type of cosmology of how the world, the natural world, fitted together. And so it was to teach people their cultural or knowledge practices, their bank of knowledge of the physical world and how it was related in a way to a spiritual world, so it was to reinforce their relationship to the spiritual cosmos. So in my artistic practice, my curatorial practice, mostly uh, the more serious uh, curated shows that I do, I have done single artist uh, curated and brought together collections of work by one artist or two artists but generally, it's, I've worked with groups of artists that I've brought together across age and genders around ideas and statements that bring their minds into a sharp focus around a particular concept, a particular aspect of an Aboriginal history. And the Aboriginal memorial was such a work. It was by 43 artists in all, uh, 44 including me, and uh, those artists came from five different communities over a 500 square kilometre space in the land. Originally I started out with eight senior artists who were very well known and practised uh, uh, visual artists, but the interesting thing about it is if they were visual artists in this society, they were also singers and dancers and did lots of other things. They could weave, they could uh, spin, they could do many things, they could make sculptures. They were artists across the board and very practiced because they'd been doing these things every year since puberty. Uh, so they've been doing it for 20, 30 years. They'd been singing, dancing, uh, taking part in a performative practice that included visual arts for that amount of time. So it wasn't uh, difficult then uh, to bond those people together because in their ceremonies, all those people would have worked together quite collaboratively anyway, so it wasn't inconsistent with them to put all their trees together, their poles, into this installation of a grove of trees, this forest of dead souls. After a long period of uh, discussions with various patrons, the curator of Aboriginal art at the National Gallery and a journalist, uh, Chips McAnulty, organised that I could meet James Mollison, the director of the Australian National Gallery. We discussed the bicentenary and about my proposal. And he said, this is the perfect thing that we would love to uh, commission for the bicentennial year. But I was able to negotiate that it would be on permanent display as a mark of where the national history of that expression began with the near annihilation of Aboriginal people. But that period of negotiation was pretty tension-ridden 
because uh, people in Ram and Ginning were not unaware of Captain Cook coming and the other Europeans coming to Australia, but it was a history that was distant to them in, in lots of other ways. We didn't quite know how the rest of the country would take to this statement that this, this is what 200 years of European occupation had meant to Aboriginal people. When the time came in, uh, in the middle of 1988 to wrap and ship the poles, the floors of uh, the small tin shed serving as the art centre almost threatened to collapse under the weight. The National Gallery of Australia curators, uh, Wally Caruana and Gary Lee, came north to check our progress and they assisted with the packing. After a mammoth effort over several days with the help of local artist Roy Barunula, Charlie Jutta, Lawrence Leslie from uh, Moree and Barry Jarriang, the bulk were wrapped uh, in uh, bubble plastic, paper and uh, tar paper to protect them against uh, rain, etc. They were loaded on the town tip truck, the biggest vehicle in, in the district, to be driven to the coast where a barge took the bulk of them to Darwin. From there, the Biennale uh, had uh, arranged that they were backloaded in the luggage compartments and trailers of tourist buses that uh, got them to Sydney. Another smaller group were uh, arranged to go in uh, a number, small number of charter aircraft that uh, then met uh, this group from the barge. In that time, uh, they'd started to use the Pier 23. It had become vacant, but it's a very great venue just adjacent to the city, so it's a very convenient uh, site. It's got high ceilings, it's large and wide, etc. It's a great venue, and it's got a, the backdrop it's of the harbour, you know, which is what Sydney's famous for, the environment. If you want to get the spirit of Sydney, that's, uh, that's certainly when you look out those doors and you see the harbour all around you, you're covered in three sides by the harbour. So uh, that was uh, where this was going to be installed. We were offered the very end, uh, the end of the wharf. So when you came into the wharf, you could look down and at the end of the wharf, you'd see in the distance the Aboriginal memorial, these trees. After installing the work uh, at the uh, Pier 23 Bond Stores venue of the Biennale of Sydney, with the assistance of young Aboriginal artists and non-Aboriginal artists, including Fiona Foley and Govan Duncan, artist David Malungi, his son Johnny Durakayu, Paddy Lilipiana and Paddy Waibaranga sang to concentrate the space in the opening night. The actual installation was around uh, the shape of uh, the river that ran down uh, near Ram and Ginning. And all the uh, different artists uh, representing each, their family groups, their clan groups and totemic groups, uh, environmentally totemic groups were also arranged around east and west around that river pathway. So uh, I brought a group of uh, only men this time, uh, because mainly because of budgetary considerations. Uh, we brought them down and they sang and walked through the, the pathway to uh, consecrate it, so to speak. Director Nick Waterloo described the work in his catalogue essay as the single most important piece in the exhibition. The work was seen as important to Aboriginal people too. The National Aboriginal and Islander Day Observance Committee, NADOC Week people, named the uh, contributing Aboriginal uh, Ram and Ginning artist as the Aboriginal Artist of the Year.
The 1980s were certainly important times because people started to really crystallise a lot of ideas that were thrown around in the 60s and 70s to do with Australian cultural life, Australian intellectual life, and about positions of Aboriginal, of, uh, Aboriginal people. But I saw um, Jean-Hubert Martin then, and I think part of... Uh, uh, he'd been developing his own line of thought, but I'm sure the way that uh, Aboriginal art was taken into the Biennale of Sydney in Australia was convincing him, if he, he needed more convincing, that, uh, that other non-Western art should be in uh, any surveys of uh, contemporary art in, uh, in Europe and certainly in the United States, for that matter, that these other people should be included uh, and thought about after the Biennale of Sydney, the memorial was uh, re-erected for permanent display at the National Gallery of Australia. David Malungi travelled again to receive the NAIDOC Award in uh, Brisbane uh, with fellow con contributors, uh, Gunnel Bingu artists George Milbrew and Roy Barunula. They then went on to Canberra where they sang uh, a second time for the public opening and consecration at the National Gallery. National Gallery Director James Mollison said in his opening speech that it was probably one of the greatest works of art to have been made in this country. Now, since uh, its first uh, appearance in the 1988 Biennale of Sydney, a debate has taken place about the final resting place of the Aboriginal memorial. Some argued that the poles should be placed uh, outdoors in a relevant uh, public place and allowed to decompose from natural uh, weathering as happens in the actual ritual. I argued against this uh, as it would uh, be too convenient for white Australia to forget its existence and the crime it refers to. As uh, people killed Aboriginal people or tried to annihilate Aboriginal people, they also almost uh, could be described as a war on the landscape. Uh, in the, the 200 years uh, uh, of colonisation up to 1988, uh, the number of trees um, had halved, uh, the number of forests had halved uh, in size and number. Uh, and the trees, there were trees that were enormous, of enormous sizes uh, and uh, a diversity of species that uh, were gradually whittled away. So by 1988, only half the number of trees uh, that existed in 1788 still existed. Before European settlement, the forested area of the Australian continent was about 700 million hectares, or around 10% of the total land uh, area. But the forests are now less than 5% in 1988. Between 320 to 400 million hectares have been lost in just over 200 years of colonisation. The greatest loss in terms of area has occurred in Queensland, where practically half of the Australia-wide loss occurred. The thing now is, of course, that it's still going on today, uh, that they're still cutting down these trees, they're still destroying forest and old forest, and they're still killing Aboriginal people. So it's an interesting time to make this record considering the movement of Black Lives Matter. Well, in Australia, uh, part of the reasons why I made the Aboriginal Memorial was that it really until, or even now, uh, black lives in Australia haven't mattered. They certainly hadn't mattered until in uh, 1988. They hadn't mattered. There were hundreds of thousands of Aboriginal people shot and killed 
on this continent. Part of the reason why I used those words, shot and killed, defending their country, was that I'd seen a film, an artist brought me a film in the mid uh, mid-1980s, uh, a man who was really like my mentor, a really uh, incredible human being uh, who was a major ceremonial leader, a major, major cultural leader within that whole Eastern Arnhem Land district. And his uh, son had been uh, a member of the Northern Lands Council and uh, was given these cassettes, these video cassettes to watch as uh, part of uh, his briefing for meetings. And one of those videos that uh, he brought to show me was a film by John Pilger called The Secret Country. John Pilger, of course, is a great advocate for the rights of Aboriginal people. John Pilger described how his family had a house up on the Hawkesbury and how he'd come to realise there were Aboriginal people that were there. He'd found Aboriginal art in the cliff faces and in the caves around the Hawkesbury. And later in life, he came to realise that, in fact, a great war had taken place. And those people that were there had died, as he described, defending their country. And that's what uh, really inspired me to then focus on making this memorial, that there were very few uh, Aboriginal memorials in a land that's full of memorials. Every little country town has a memorial to non-Aboriginal Australians mainly who died fighting in a colonial war in Europe or defending colonies, the empire, defending the empire in other parts of the world. I didn't know at that time of an Aboriginal memorial to us, to our people who died defending our country. In my own land, the Bunjalung people's land of the Northern Rivers of New South Wales, there were massacres around Grafton and the Clarence River. There were hundreds of people killed in a number of those massacres where the bodies floated down the river past Grafton for days. There were massacres in Ballina. There is a memorial there. There's a monument that has been erected there to the killing of those people. The interesting thing was that these massacres were recounted in the local newspapers of the 1800s where older colonists would talk about how they killed this number of people. It happened all over this whole of New South Wales, the whole of Queensland, the whole of the continent, and was continuing at least up into the 1930s or 40s. More recently, you have the Black Lives Matter movement that comes out of the United States and to do with African Americans and Latino people in that society here in Australia. Although Aboriginal people only make up 2% of the population, we make up 30% of the prison population. We make up to 30% of the male population in prisons. We make up 30% of the female populations in prisons. This is really uh, just a way of a continuation of the war to uh, control us, to disempower us, uh, and to kill us. And uh, this is the, no the way now, this is the form of that war against us today. Now, I conceived and assembled the, the Aboriginal Memorial in 1988, the bicentenary of the setting up of a penal colony by the British Crown that became Australia the nation. In 2020, Australia marks the 250th anniversary of Cook's first arrival that is so revered uh, as uh, defining the nation, we are told. Throughout my own life as an Aboriginal person, 
It appears to me that around uh, every generation, Australians strive for absolution in regard to the nation's crimes against Aboriginal people. Yet on each occasion, as they approach the historic moral moment, inexplicably, they fall back and recoil almost in terror at the implication that they could be held responsible. An Australian term, the never, never. And so the denial continues and Australians wonder why in many parts of the world they are considered racist, they are considered unintelligent, they are considered uncaring and inhuman brutes. A simple but powerful step is to make the conceptual leap to be honest about the past.